Okay, it's Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. In fact, this is Talking Tax with Tom. And it should be no surprise that Tom joins us. Tom Yamachika, the president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation, uh, to learn about the fiscal policy and um, I guess the balance sheet uh, and the budget for the state of Hawaii, which we all need to think about right now in the COVID time. Good morning, Tom. Nice to see your smiling face. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me on the show. So here we are taking our a uh, bi-weekly snapshot. Uh, and as we left this exciting story, we had a $2.3 billion shortfall in the budget. Uh, we had spent remarkably $150 million uh, for pay raises for the HGA employees, even though some of them are not working. They're at home, not working. Um, and then we had, uh, I read in the paper, that we spent $20 million for a footpath over Alamoana, which did not seem appropriate in these difficult times. And we're sharing the expense with the Howard Hughes Corporation on that. But query, do we really need it? Um, anyway, it just seems like things are askew. We are, we are, in, we are moving slowly or perhaps not so slowly over a cliff in terms of fiscal policy. And the legislature, I think it's, it's closing this week, is it? I'm not sure they have achieved anything to deal with the problem. Well, the, the, the legislature adjourned last week. Last, last week, Friday. last Friday, right. Yeah. Okay. So they're and done. So they're done. And uh, well, what did they do actually to deal with these problems? Uh, well, it's as you say, I mean, the uh, the problems were kind of like sent up to the governor and now the governor can decide what, what if anything to do about them. The, uh, the pay raises, for example, uh, I think the legislature uh, felt, and this is for, from me talking with the, you know, a few insiders, uh, that they really couldn't do anything about it. So they sent it upstairs. Uh, and uh, the governor has more options like A, vetoing the bill, B, uh, signing it or letting it become law, but uh, implementing budget restrictions, which, which he's done in the past. Uh, he could also uh, impose uh, furloughs, like the infamous furlough Fridays of a few years ago, uh, or uh, do other things to force the government to, uh, to be smaller. And he's, he's, he's explicitly threatened to do some of these things um, with, uh, you know, the, the, the union heads going off the deep end in response. Uh, but, you know, what, what, what actually will be done, who knows? Yeah, well, interesting, when it came out, I think it was in Civil Beat, and they had, uh, you know, a, um, I guess an appropriate list of uh, who among the legislature voted for that, who voted against it, and so forth. Um, I guess they knew there was this, there's going to be pushback on it. And you know what? A lot of people have, have said to me, they don't like this, this bill at all. They really ticked off at the people who voted for it because it didn't seem appropriate in a, in a time of crisis. What's your feedback on it? Well, I mean, I, I, I think uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are uh, some businesses that, that aren't open and can't be open. Uh, the proprietors of those businesses aren't making any income at all. Uh, there are people who have been laid off, lots of people who have been laid off. Uh, they're not getting any income, period, uh, unless they can find other employment. And then uh, even with uh, their being on the street or uh, on the, in the unemployment lines, uh, they're waiting for unemployment checks, and they're not coming because of the backlogs and other things that are uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, what state government does. Yeah, well, the interesting, I'm thinking back to an earlier discussion you and I had, is that there are a lot of uh, state employees at home being paid in full, not doing anything. And uh, there was an effort um, to repurpose them and have them work for, I guess, the Department of Labor to process those unemployment claims and checks. But they didn't want to do it, even though they're being paid anyway. Um, and I guess that stayed that way. That never got resolved. So we never got the extra workforce. Yeah, we no, nothing that we've heard about anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's really tragic. Yeah, I mean, th there was um, that uh, <laughs> with the unemployment processing, the uh, Department of Labor did set up a, a site at the convention center for quote unquote volunteers, and some some you know folks actually did volunteer quote unquote that you come into work and go there. Uh, the volunteers included people from other departments as well as uh, legislative staffers. Oh, that's encouraging. 
I mean, after all, everybody tells us we're in this together. We have to work together. We have to collaborate in every way possible to deal with the crisis. And yet there are parts of state government that are not really collaborating. I also saw in the paper recently this thing about the uh, $20 million state expense for a footpath over Alamoana. As I recall, um, the total cost of that is $30 million. Uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation is paying $10 million, and the state is paying $20 million. And it's, it struck me as we managed to get along for a long time without a, without a bridge over, a footbridge over Alamoana. Um, do we really need to spend that kind of money now? Who's watching the store? I thought we had people who were very careful about this kind of expenditure in the legislature, the money committees. How did this one get through? Well, um, the, the budget bill is a huge document. Uh, it's uh, hundreds of pages long, and uh, it's very easy for something to get, you know, to slip past. Yeah. Um, I, I, I also kind of brought attention to uh, the Aloha Stadium. Uh, the, the current plan is for it to be developed by a public-private partnership. The state share is going to be of the order of $350 million. So what, about you know, 10 or more times uh, the Alamoana footpath. And uh, so what are they going to build? They're going to build an entertainment district. Well, you know, it strikes we me. Need, it's, we need to be entertained. Yeah, well, this is the wrong time for that. It, it strikes me that, um, you know, there's this complacency and complacency. Um, you know, we have a major pandemic on our hands in the world. You don't have to read the paper about five minutes a day, and you can see, or, or watch the, any news show on television. And you can see how major this is and how threatening this is. And yet, you know, we focus on old issues, old projects, projects where, you know, the advocates of the projects don't consider COVID at all. They don't consider the pandemic at all. You'd think we changed our priorities, but here we're sailing into a footpath, a footbridge, and a stadium expense of hundreds of millions when we're... In well, I think one of the problems is there, there is a huge, huge time lag between, uh, you know, when you can tee up a construction project and when it actually gets done. And at the federal level, like for highways and so forth, it's like it could be 20 years. Uh, here it's, you know, five years, depending on, on, on how big the project is. But, uh, you know, Things like that cannot turn on a dime. No, but, you know, if you're in, in a time of COVID, you know, the word is all hands on deck. Let's focus. And it just doesn't seem to me that we're focusing. That's, that's definitely not happening. Yeah. It's definitely not happening. So, um, okay, what's the status? Uh, oh, we, I wanted to ask you there was something in the paper late yesterday about, um, about hearings um, in, the, in the legislature, even though I guess the session is over now, um, questioning how well the administration, David Ige, was doing on his COVID, uh, his work, you know, to deal with COVID. And uh, from the article, it was not a friendly hearing at all. They were very critical of how the administration was doing. Do you know about this? Were you there? Uh, no, but... Uh... I do know that uh, some of the legislative committees uh, were still meeting. Uh, the the special COVID-19 committees, uh, I think uh, both the House and Senate both have them. Uh, they were still conducting hearings. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what is being accomplished, uh, you know, now, uh, but uh, I guess people need to debate and Kind of figure out what to do if they haven't already done it. I mean, you know, the the uh, we would have hoped that that the uh, that the debate so far would have helped, you know, shape a plan for how we deal with the pandemic. Uh, but where's the plan? Um, it seems to you know, things seems to change day by day, and uh, uh, you know, it's. Uh, just just recently, for example, the um, uh, the reopening date for tourism got pushed back one month. I mean, not not that it uh, 
but wasn't needed, probably was. Uh, but it does underscore the fluid nature of these things. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the bigger question is, you know, what's up America? Why, you know, what, why is this, this pandemic still raging when, the other, when other countries have gotten under control? Well, in all what, fairness, what makes us so horrible? Yeah. In all fairness, I mean, a lot of this had to do with Trump. Um, it's not just that he's not leading, but he's actively confusing everybody, uh, including especially the states who are watching him and listening to him and cannot get a beat on where to go. So they don't make the same decision and they don't hold on their decisions. Everything is coming out of Washington is confusing, disruptive, and so forth. So, I mean, that, you know, I give them credit. I give the states some sympathy for that. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we really haven't settled down on things we said we would do. For example, um, you know, the, the testing on the mainland before the passengers get on a plane. I don't understand why that's not in place. That should be pretty basic. It should have been pretty basic a, lot, a long time ago. Um, so uh, if, if there is a plan, assuming there is a plan to do that, it's not being implemented. I, I don't know. I don't know who's responsible, but uh, whatever task force David Ige has in place, um, you know, should be under under the gun about that. Don't you think? Yeah. That, well, that part of it was was put over thirty days as well. Uh, so even if somebody gets a test, uh, a negative test, and wants to jump on a plane, they'll still be quarantined once they're here. Yeah. Let's see it happen. first. Well, it could happen right now. There's no reason why it, it doesn't happen. We're still operating on that quarantine, 14 day quarantine thing. By the way, there was a lawsuit by the ACLU in the federal court set aside that thing as in violation of the Commerce Clause. Um, do you know the status of that? Uh, I think there were, there were two suits. One of them went away. And, uh, and I think the other one uh, was being argued. I think, I, I think it's later this week. Mm. On on a uh, you know motion for a preliminary injunction or something like that. Yeah, well, that could change things suddenly if an injunction was issued one way or the other. Uh, okay, anyway, so let's talk about the uh, unemployment insurance and how well it's doing because people are running out of their benefits, um, and of course that six hundred dollar supplement from the federal government will run out too. Can you talk about that? Well, what I can what I can talk about is how these unemployment benefits are funded. I mean, we have uh, a, a supposedly self-correcting uh, unemployment insurance system. The the way the way it works is uh, the tax rate is determined at the end of the year based on uh, the employer's experience rating, namely uh, whether it's had to pay out lots of money uh, for claims and is you know kind of more prone to that kind of thing, and uh, by the overall health of the fund. So given that the overall health of the fund is one of the key factors, uh, I think we are, we are going to be looking at uh, an automatic bump in all of the UI rates come the end of the year and the beginning of next, uh, because it, it automatically kicks in based on the health of the fund. The, uh, that part of the benefits that come from external sources, like the 600 bucks from the feds, or the 100 bucks from the state with Fed money, they don't count. Uh, but uh, but but the there is still a key component of the benefits that do come from the unemployment fund, and that's what is measured at the end of the year. And we have been paying out lots and lots of money. So, so are you saying uh, that the employer contribution will go up? Yes, this automatically at the end of the year. Wrong time for it to go up. <laughs> well, I don't think people were, were really concentrating on it. I mean, there, there were, uh, it's, it's an automatic thing and automatically kicks in unless somebody steps in to stop it, which, you know, legislatures have in the past. Uh, but I don't think they were focused on that this year. Yeah. And, and they're, again, they're out of session now. And yeah. Did, and the, the, one, the one tax bill that, the, uh, that was passed during the session uh, was... Uh, one that relates to how we conform with the Federal Internal Revenue Code. So what it says 
is that for state purposes and state income tax, we are going to follow some of the key provisions, um, such as uh, we're not going to pe uh, treat PPP forgiveness as income. Uh, we are going to allow the uh, additional $300 above the line deduction for charitable contributions because the charities need money too. Um, we, uh, uh, we are going to allow plan loans uh, that are in increased limits like the, like how the Fed does. Uh, but um, there are some provisions that we're not going to adopt. And uh, for example, um, the, you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, changed how businesses can use uh, net operating losses. Like if you, if you lose money one year and then you make money in the second, can, can you then use the past year's losses to offset current year's income? And the answer always used to be yes. Uh, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you can only uh, use 80% of the current year's, uh, current year's income to be offset by uh, prior year losses. So even, even if you have tons and tons and tons of prior year losses, you still have to pay 20% uh, of the uh, of your current year's income, no matter what. Is there a reason for that? Uh, they need money. Thank you. Uh, I, I yeah, can't. But, 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 um, and, and so on the federal level, they said, okay, well, uh, businesses are hurting. So, um, uh, so they will allow uh, businesses to absorb 100% of prior year losses into current income for 2020 and 2021, okay? Um, I, just as kind of a temporary measure, they also allowed uh, that operating losses to be carried back into previous years when you did have income and paid tax, so the tax would come back to you. Um, the state uh, decoupled from both of those provisions uh, saying, okay, we're not gonna allow carry back losses and we're not going to allow more than 80% to offset, 80% uh, of taxable income mm -hmm. to be offset by net operating losses. So this, so we're going to be, we're going to keep following uh, the, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, uh, the, the, the issue really was, uh, well, what kind of public discussion came, you know, led to this? And the answer is none. Uh, here's why. The, uh, the bill that conforms our income tax law to the, uh, to the federal one uh, is usually uh, put into play at the beginning of the year. Uh, it incorporates the federal law changes to the end of last year. So to, to the end of 12, uh, uh, or the December 31st, 2019. So that was kind of sailing, sailing along through, went through past the Senate and then COVID hit. Okay. So um, lots of things then happened, including in March, uh, the CARES Act passed. And there, there was a big question regarding uh, what if any changes in the CARES Act we would conform to, uh, noting, for example, that we normally pass that bill at the end of, uh, or at the beginning of next session. Mm -hmm. Because, because you know, 2020 changes usually are considered in 2021, but, but we decided to pass uh, some of them anyway. Um, but the way it came up was uh, the bill that came over into House Finance, and typically this bill has a single referral on both sides. Uh, it was basically the, the plain vanilla till 2019, uh, the end of 2019 changes. Uh, you know, some people, including you know, including our organization, said, "Well, you ought to pick up some of the some of the CARES Act stuff." And it was the Department of Taxation that put together the bill. Says, "Okay, well, let's conform to this, but not that." And the House Finance Committee said, okay. Uh, so they picked that up. Um, and the Senate said, okay, uh, we won't disagree with the bill. Uh, so off it went to the governor's office. That, and, and that's where we are. Uh, was there public debate? <clears throat> Not really. I mean, the, the, the Capitol was still closed. Uh, and, and I think we, sh we could have and should have uh, had some discussion about, you know, uh, which of the provisions we're going to pick up and why. Usually this, this comes up uh, you know, in testimony and hearings um, at which uh, people can, you know, uh, address the committee and give public input, but, you know, capital's closed. This doesn't happen. 
Well, usually this uh, this bill to uh, conform the state changes to the federal changes is a, it's a slam dunk, isn't it? It's, it's pro forma. You just take the federal changes and make them into state changes, right? Uh, no, there's actually a, a, a very interesting calculus that goes on. Um, the uh, the tax department or whoever, uh, I believe it is a tax department, they, they, they figure out whether uh, some of the changes are going to cost the state money. Uh, and, uh, uh, and based on the price tag, uh, they can uh, recommend and do recommend a decoupling from certain provisions. Like most states... Uh, when they did this kind of bill, decoupled from bonus depreciation when it first came out. We did too. Um, and uh, that that has kind of been continued into into the present day. I think we've really never uh, coupled with the bonus depreciation enhancements. And, uh, and there's, there's a, a full expensing provision called Section 179. Uh, for a very long time, we uh, we basically minimally coupled that we only allowed uh, you know, twenty thousand dollars or so to be expensed, um, not like the five hundred thousand or uh, other limits that were in the federal law. I guess my question is: uh, ordinarily, are there hearings on this conforming bill? Yes, there's a generally a hearing in the House and a hearing in the Senate. They're both conducted by the money committees, and people in the tax community come and testify. They do, yes. But not this year. This year was basically written submissions um, and the capital was closed. Okay. And, and I would imagine that this, the state tax office recommendations were accepted as, as recommended. Yes, they were. Hmm. The, 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 the finance committee report says that. That's well, another, it's another casualty of, of, the, of the COVID <laughs> a fiscal ca cabin, you know, casualty of the COVID. So, where, where, you know, wh what about other critical things? What about, um, you know, paying bills, like, for example, to the employees' retirement system? That's billions. Um, and another big one is OHA. Uh, hundreds of millions go to OHA. Are, they, are these bills getting paid now? Uh, presumably so, yes. I mean, that hasn't changed. Uh, the one thing that did change, um, and I think we talked about it a little bit before, uh, was that part of the THE went to the counties before. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of the governor's emergency suspension pen, that stopped entirely. So, so the counties are not getting any, any uh, one red cent from the THT. Not that the THT is a, 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 a source of tremendous wealth anyway this year, because it's not. But uh, well, nobody's here, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nobody's here. So, um, you know, in the past, we've had the Council on Revenues and they sit and meet, I guess, what, before the session sometime in the fall, maybe? Um, and they decide... I think they, they, they meet every three months, yeah. Every, oh, every three months, okay. Um, so the yeah. question I have for you is, is the Council on Revenues updating its expectations for state revenue uh, so that the legislature, at least theoretically, would know how well or not so well we're doing? Uh, my, my understanding is that they're still meeting every three months. Uh, the legislature is required by constitution to follow uh, the revenue estimates uh, that, the, that the COR puts out uh, to you know, determine whether we have a balanced budget or not. And, and they're required to have a balanced budget. Well, are we going to have a balanced budget this year? Well, we, uh, the legislature had to pass it, so they passed it. They passed it knowing now, that it was not um, going to be able to balance the budget. No, they, 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 uh, they passed it uh, by getting uh, source, uh, funds from other sources like the, you know, the Federal CARES Act money, uh, the Rainy Day Fund, uh, borrowings, et cetera. So theoretically, it is balanced. It is balanced. But, uh, you know, are the income sources sustainable? No. It's not going to happen next year, so we'll have to basically figure out what to do next year. Next year. Yeah. Well, I, mean, you know, I hope they weren't assuming that Congress is going to pr provide additional tranches of money this year, because it looks like Congress is locked up on that. Yep. 
What about the loans? You, you mentioned a moment ago that we, we, we were going to try to balance the budget with loans. Uh, of course, that's, that's not really income so much as a loan. But um, right. you get that back. from the federal government. How does that work? It comes from the federal government. Uh, there is something called the Municipal Liquidity Facility. Uh, the uh, the unions have been talking about that a lot as a, as a way to fund the you know, the current pay raises. Uh, the uh, but as the governor said, you know, the money's got to be paid back in three years, so it's it's not a long term solution. Yeah, I, well, again, you know, there are a lot of issues like like footpaths and bridges and whatnot, stadium rebuilding and stadiums. The stadiums. Yep. And and so what you know what I what I'd like to do with you in the in the remaining couple of minutes is to try to figure out where this is all going, because I think I think we we have a certain complacency or a lack of focus on the on the true priorities, which are really threatening. Uh, what's going to happen here? Yeah, I mean, there, there really there really hasn't been a focus on determining what the true priorities are. I I, I don't think there really has been. Uh, any focused discussion on that? If uh, you know, if it has been taking place, it's been taking place in back rooms. We, we in, the, in the public haven't seen it, and you know, I hope I hope we uh, get to see that. You know, some of that um, in the uh, in the coming weeks. Well, let's assume there have been those discussions in the back rooms, whatever, for the lack of a you know a steady session. Um, what what can we hope for there? We can hope for, I guess, a reasonable expectation of getting enough revenue to balance the budget. Um, and uh, we can, you know, have enough money to pay unemployment claims uh, or even extend them um, and, um, and, you know, uh, keep people, keep people solvent in, in their efforts to get food and, and medicines and whatever they need, pay the rent and all that. That's, that's, that would be my well, I, I, uh, optimistic I think, view of it. Yeah, I, I think what's got to happen is there, there needs to be some discussion about, you know, where in government to cut. Um, we, we, can't, we can't maintain the current level of government. It's just, it's not sustainable. And we got to be thinking of what do we need and, you know, what would we like to have but can't afford? What, what things would be at issue then, Tom? Uh, you know, you, you look through the uh, budgets and programs of a, of a lot of a lot of departments, especially the big ones. Uh, DOE comes to mind. Uh, do, do they really need all of these uh, programs? Do they really need all these administrators? Do we do we really need uh, all of these all of these things? Uh, if we don't, you know, come on, let's get rid of it and maybe bring it back when I, in a year when we have money. Yeah, well, there's billions we involved have, there. Have, yeah, we, we, we have we have people who can't you know uh, who can't find food and shelter. I mean, let's get to, let's take care of them. Yeah, well, at the same time, DOE is asking for extra money to make things safer in the event of a reopening of the schools. I'm not sure that's settled yet, or that it's funded yet. But that would also that would involve not a reduction. Of, of the money that goes to DOE, but an increase in the money that goes to DOE. Again, you know, we have to make uh, priority calls. Uh, is this something we really, really need or is it something that would be nice to have? And if it's something that we have, it, it's gonna be nice to have, uh, you know, stow it until we have some more money. Okay, so on the one side, we were looking at the possibility that there had been backroom meetings and even though the legislature was, um, you know, uh, had a Swiss cheese kind of session. And even though that it's out of session now, there are, as you said, there are committees meetings, such as the committee to look into David E. Gates' plan on COVID. Um, so the, the optimistic view is that they, they must be doing something um, and that and they are aware of the issues uh, that, that we've been mentioning here. And somehow they'll be able to pull it all together in time to avoid going over the cliff. Um, but the other possibility is the pessimistic possibility. And if we were pessimistic to say that, well, um, whatever room, backroom meetings there were, whatever post-session or extra-session meetings there were, there were no, no solutions. There was discussion, but no solutions. There were hearings, but no solutions. 
in that event, you know, we're left to whatever the situation is, which is a, started out as a $2.3 billion shortfall. And it, does, it doesn't sound like we've actually made any progress on that. Um, and, um, you know, despite the loans and the extra money, which we may or may not get from Washington, uh, we may wind up in the hole. And, and this year that matters a lot because there are people who depend on the state to eat. So my question to you is what happens on the pessimistic side? Let's assume that there have not been productive meetings by the legislature. Let's assume that, you know, you see what you get um, at the gubernatorial level. What's going to happen to us? Uh, well, uh, we're going to run out of money. And then everything stops. But what's, what's, what's everything? Government. Give me an example of a, a stoppage that would actually affect me or us. You're building a house, you want a building permit? Go government stopped. You'll be waiting for that permit for years. Uh, more than you already are. That would, that would be across the board. And, and uh, when you start thinking about it and sitting down and ans answering that question for, your, for yourself, you would come up with things like that, but plus a lot of other things where you depend on government for a lot of things. And this is especially so in, in business, in business enterprise. So if the government can't, can't function, then the economy is sure to follow, don't you think? Yeah, maybe we can talk more about that in a couple of weeks on our, yeah, on our next show. Let's do that. Let's talk about how fiscal policy affects the economy. Because I think, you know, that, that linkage, uh, coupling, if you want to use the word coupling, <laughs> is clear. Uh, that's Tom Yamachika. He's the president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Every couple of weeks, we explore these things, which you should know about. You should listen to Tom's comments and you should read up on it in the newspaper and you should make yourself uh, familiar with how this works because ultimately it's going to affect you. Thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate the discussion and the wisdom.